Uh, welcome inside Studio J, presented by Come Here NC. I'm Chris Edge, and you are Maggie Rose. I am. Welcome. Thanks, Chris. It's Ex- good to be here. Excited to have you here. Show tonight at the Rialto. Your first of th- uh, three shows in North Carolina. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then we finish off the week in South Carolina. Yeah. Your neighbor, so. And then the end of the tour, I think you're actually back here in November in Asheville. We are with Tedeschi Trucks Band. Yeah. We just got to announce that. We love those guys. Well, welcome to the state. Have you played here before? I assume you have. I've played in Asheville a bunch. It's been a while since we've been in Raleigh. Uh, last time we were here, we were with the Mavericks uh, at yeah. an amphitheater nearby. And of course, torrential downpours yeah. began right as our set was supposed to take place. So we had an abbreviated set. So we've been okay. waiting to come back. Yeah. Well, I know we're going to see you tonight at the Rialto. Yes. Great space uh, downtown or in uh, in uh, the Five Points area. Um, let's talk about the new album, No One Gets Out Alive, which seems like an ominous, dark yeah. title for the album. But yes, without any context, yeah. it's it's very looming. But it's not. No, it's, it's a call to action, really. It's about the urgency of life. And this was a reflection that I was having a lot during the pandemic when... I was kind of waiting for all the circumstances Mm. to be perfect again for touring or making a record or, you know, getting back together with friends. And I kind of realized that if you wait on all the chips to fall perfectly, then you'll find excuses. And I wanted to make something beautiful and uh, write through some of the loss and and gratitude that I was feeling at the time. So the album is sort of, I don't want to say it's old, but it, it's been around for a minute. It's, it's It was it's, released it's, April 5th, but a lot of the songs had been completed for a long time. So mm-hmm. I was chomping at the bit to get it out. And I presented the fully mastered album to the label that I'm now signed with um, probably a year ago, actually. Wow. Or, or maybe even a little bit more. And they embraced it fully, which was really kind of uh, pleasantly surprising for me having been in Nashville as long as I have um, and there's an aspect of me that was pretty jaded and they thawed that out by yeah just jumping on board and and not telling me to change anything either and that's sort of what this album is about it's about going for it and I feel like they in a way rewarded me for doing just that yeah the title track is a big song it yeah. starts off sort of slower but then at the end there the strings are there and it just gets it just has this big feel to it it's anthemic in a way yes and it started i wrote it with natalie hemby and sunny sweeney who are phenomenal talents mm-hmm. but if you hear the work tape from that day it's almost like a folksy piano ballad oh. and then uh it transformed in the studio because of the people that i had around me where they're like, no, you got to go for it. This is yeah. a, your live and let die moment. And you Wait, know, did you say that intentionally? Because I, I actually thought it had that feel. It was a big it influence had the McCartney for feel. This. Yeah. Yes. It's, there's this unapologetic ending to this song. And coincidentally, it happened to be the first song that we cut, the band cut in the studio in the sequence of songs for the whole record. Mm. I had an inkling that it was going to be called No One Gets Out Alive, but... The fact that that was how we set the tone was uh, very serendipitous because I was like, oh, is this too much, guys? I was a little (laughs) intimidated by the bigness of it. And everyone around me was like, absolutely not. This is what what you're here to make. And just doing that in itself is 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 getting behind the message of the song. Yeah. The album for me has a subtle 70s vibe to it. Um, I also, love it. You're saying all the right. There's things. also a track on there that reminds me of Carol King. I think it's. Ooh. I think it's too young. Yes, that song has a Carol King vibe to me. Carol King was a huge influence for the sounds of this mm. record. I, the album actually turned 50. Tapestry. Yeah. During the pandemic, we covered the band, uh, our own version of "I Feel the Earth Move," and then I think I just was playing it over and over again and her ability to just write a great song and a timeless song is something yeah. that you know i really aspire to try and possess and just that laurel canyon sound and yeah. you can hear all it. of that it seeped in there yeah part of it was intentional but all of it was you know by osmosis i think just 
spending so much time with that music. Can you talk to us a little bit about writing? I think when people hear that you write songs, there's this vision of somebody grabbing a pen, writing it on paper, and here's my song that I wrote. But there's a lot more to it than just writing lyrics or putting that together. Right? Can you just talk about what, what is that like when you're writing a song? Yes. It's a lot messier than that because the origins of a song can be musical or can be lyrical. And um, on previous projects, I kind of had the same collaborators on this project just because of the nature of our world. I was starting a lot of these ideas uh, in solitude. So Mm. the music thematically became a lot more introspective than a lot of other songs. I had a really great list of collaborators and co-wrote all of these songs with, you know, this short list of people, but it was more personal. Yeah. And I think one thing I try to tell people that benefits me as a songwriter is it's so much more than just what's happening in that session. You don't say, oh, let's write a song tomorrow at 11 a.m. and expect all those ideas to just appear. You have to be observing all the time. I think that's how people see it. Is yeah. that you schedule a time, you go to a room and you start brainstorming. Right. But that's not the case. I have tons of voice memos in my phone, some of them horrible, but every now and then you have that nugget of brilliance that yeah. just arrived to you. And it's usually a gift and you just have to be there to receive it. Like it's not, most songwriters aren't just prolific and spilling with creativity all the time. They're just paying attention to those little moments that happen yeah. while you're living your life. I read uh, James Taylor say that. He says that the songs just come to him. Which can be kind of daunting yeah. too, because you're like, God, who was that person who wrote that song? And yeah. you, begin to get imposter syndrome but then Mm. if you just listen and you're quiet another idea will come along and I think that's also why I want to keep creating because I want to just make sure that whatever I'm putting out there is actually an impression of what I'm going through in that moment and then songs will evolve over time like uh, some songs on this record I wrote from one place and as they've gone out and lived their life and people have listened to them and shared Mm -hmm. their stories of how it resonates with them. It's changed the meaning of that song to me to make it relevant today. Yeah. When you moved to Nashville, I guess this is about 16 years ago. Yes. Um, I feel like it's a double-edged sword in, in that Nashville itself is a great ecosystem for creating music, writing, performing and all that. But it's also probably extremely intimidating because the talent level is extremely high. What was it like for you 16 years ago, making your way to that city and having these big dreams of becoming a songwriter and an artist? I think it was amazing to be adjacent to all these incredible talents. Mm. I definitely had to humble myself and listen, and it was intense. Like I always called it this baptism by fire kind of experience where you're like, whoa, I'm... I'm in the presence of someone who has really mastered the art of writing a song. And I tried to just be a sponge and pay attention to that. But I also felt um, in some ways, a lot of the opportunities that were granted to me early on expedited the process Mm. in a way where maybe I should have taken a little more time to really figure out who I was and what kind of music I wanted to put out initially because I had to kind of rebrand after a yeah. while once I knew who I was more. And I'm yeah, glad because, that I survived that. Yeah, because you moved to when you were, you, you, I think if I read correctly, you were a sophomore in college. And then yes. two months later, you're in Nashville. Mm-hmm. That's pretty quick. Yeah, I was pretty 19. Young. Yeah. Very young. And uh, I'm glad that I had the opportunity I did to catalyze that move to Nashville because I needed to, that's where I began my specialization. I was studying music at Clemson, but there was no way that I was going to get the exposure and training that I did by moving to Nashville, to the environment with talent, also being exposed to the workings of this industry, which are crazy. And um, I grew up really fast, but I also feel like I kind of, because I released music so early, had to grow up in front of an audience that was watching me figure things out. When you think about performing, um, 
your voice is amazing. So I feel like that part Thank of it you. for you is probably effortless because you're just a terrific singer. What um, what other things do you have to do as a performer that maybe you think you're not so good at or that have been a challenge for you? I, I think because singing has always been second nature to me, there are other things that I wish would come more easily. Like yeah. my guitar teacher and I always joke about the fact she's like, you can't hold your guitar playing to the same standard that you do your vocals. You're going to have to practice more. You're mm. going to have to you know, dare to suck a little bit more <laughs> for a little longer. And I think also some of my favorite artists to watch are not necessarily the most technically capable singers. Right. They are people who know who they are and are able to convey that in a way that's compelling to watch. Right. So I think it's just always trying to be honest with yourself and where you're at and explore the human experience and try and, you know, connect with people based on that as well as you can. And musicianship is super important. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's not. Um, but I think it's those other things to make you a well-rounded artist that yeah. you have to always be working on every day. I'm never going to be like, I'm done. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've figured out how to do this. Yeah. I think it's watching people on the journey that's entertaining and fun. Maggie Rose, thanks for coming by Studio J. It's great to Thank have you, you here. Uh, thanks looking, for your questions. Looking forward to seeing you tonight at the Rialto. We're excited. We're looking forward to it. My friend Nick McDaniels is opening up. Yeah, and from Big Something. Yes, and we grew up together. He's what? we went to the same elementary school. Oh, get in out Maryland. Of here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yes, and we're doing an after party uh, with another uh, childhood friend of mine, Joe Natelli, at Devolve. So it's like a big family reunion tonight. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. Thank you.